to follow. I will do my best. So I'm Ben. I'm a neurology reg in East London, and I'm doing a PhD at Queen Mary on this topic. So by the end of this talk, I'm going to hopefully convince you that the answer to this question is a resounding yes. So I think we should be studying MS genetics across diverse ancestral backgrounds, and hopefully I'm going to convince you that there are several good scientific arguments for doing this, and that the equity, the ethical arguments alone, they're important, but there is a strong scientific case on its own merits. So I have no relevant financial conflicts, but I think it's probably a relevant conflict to tell you that this is the topic of my PhD, so clearly I am highly partisan, and I think the answer is yes. So... To begin with, I thought a quote from the Queen, the dearly departed, Queen Elizabeth II. And we've already heard from Sergio how many decades of work, how much blood, sweat and tears it takes to build genetic cohorts. It takes an awful lot of effort to get the sample sizes you need. And she said, it's worth remembering that it's often the small steps, not the giant leaps, that bring about the most lasting change. And if these guys had given up when they only found the HLA back in 1972, we wouldn't be where we are today with an impressive genetic landscape and an incredibly comprehensive understanding of how genetics influences risk. And the same is true of progression, and progression is much earlier along that journey. So before I go into the case for, what about the case against? So why hasn't this been done to anywhere near the same extent as it has been for people of European ancestry? And there are three really good arguments. So first of all, money and time. It takes a lot of time to build these cohorts, and it takes a lot of cash to genotype people. So this is a genotyping chip from Illumina. These still cost about 50 quid per participant in the UK. Maybe you have a better rate in the US. But it's expensive, and to do this on scale with 40,000, 50,000 people, not to mention tens of thousands of controls, is expensive. Another really important argument is, what if the genetics is exactly the same? What if you go to all of this time, all of this money, to study MS genetics across different ancestries, and you find that actually the genetic architecture is identical. W would that just be a waste of money and time? And hopefully I'll convince you that it wouldn't be a waste. So wh what do we know so far? Well, you've already heard an amazing tour de force of where we're at with the genetics of MS susceptibility. So through this impressive international collaboration, studying the genetic basis of MS in 50,000 cases, 70,000 controls, the IMSGC has shown that MS is an awful lot like other complex diseases in that there is lots of variation across the genome at hundreds and probably thousands of genes where common variation has an individually small but collectively large effect on risk. So each individual genetic change that Sergio described probably increases your risk by 10 or 20 or max 30% outside of the MHC. But collectively, all of these signals across the genome account for a large heritability. So MS susceptibility is highly heritable. But there's a problem with those studies, and, and the problem is that they have focused pretty much exclusively on people of European descent. So people of European ancestry, mainly from white ethnic backgrounds. And that's thrown into quite stark light when you compare the sample sizes of these different genetic studies. So the IMSGC recruited an amazing 50,000 European ancestry cases, but the largest efforts in a South Asian cohort recruited 270 cases, and the largest efforts in an Afri African American cohort recruited 1,400 cases. So these are, these are also laudable efforts, so it's the same people. People have tried really hard. The sample sizes have been an order of magnitude lower. And the reason that's a problem, again, you've seen the slide a little bit similar to this in Sergio's talk, is that you need big numbers to show effects for a common disease like MS, where the individual effects of each genetic variant are small. So this is a lovely cartoon from a recent review by Anne Goris and, and her team, showing that you need tens of thousands of cases to get to where we are today. So to see over 100 genetic risk loci, genes that increase your risk of MS, to see that with statistical confidence, you need tens of thousands of cases. So that's why the low sample size outside of European ancestry is a big problem. And this is not just a problem that affects multiple sclerosis, it's a problem in genetics research more broadly. If you look across all kinds of common diseases, high blood pressure, chronic kidney disease, lupus, you see the same thing. So here's a cartoon showing you psychiatric disorders. These are really well studied. The psychiatric genetics community is, is really amazing. 
But when you compare the makeup of the world's population over here, you can see that the world is made up about 15%, 20% of people of European ancestry. But that blue bar, the people of European ancestry, is grossly overrepresented in genetic studies of complex disease. That 15 to 20% occupy about 85 to 90% of people in genetic studies of disease. So there's a gross mismatch here between who lives in the world and who is studied in genetic studies of complex disease. So MS is no exception. We shouldn't beat ourselves up. And some people will tell you that that's perhaps not a problem because, in fact, MS is a white disease. It's a disease that really only affects white people, and so th there's not much point studying it outside of people of, of white ethnicities. And we know now that's categorically untrue. I think most people who see patients knew this was untrue for a while. We now have really good data showing that it's untrue. So there's good data from my supervisor, Ruth Dobson's work in London, and there's great data from the Californian Kaiser Permanente cohort as well. So this is from Annette Langer Gould's group, showing you that in California, in fact, the prevalence of MS is pretty much identical between black Americans and white Americans. So you can see this is prevalence per 100,000 on the y-axis, and this is the total men and women. This bar is the black Americans, this bar is the white Americans. It's the same. MS affects everyone, so why should we not study its genetic basis in everyone? But we can do better than that. Those are kind of the prima facie reasons why this is probably an interesting and important thing to do. But I want to convince you that there are really good scientific arguments for doing this, and that what we'll learn from doing this will benefit everyone with MS in the long term. So the first thing is fine mapping. Studying the genetic basis of MS in different ancestries will let us do something called trans-ancestry or cross-ancestry fine mapping. And that's the process of taking a GWAS result, so taking a, a peak of association where you know that within the genome near a gene there's an association signal with MS, and trying to identify what the driving change is, what individual letter change in DNA is driving that signal. And that sounds straightforward, but it's actually quite difficult to do. And the reason it's difficult to do is because we inherit our DNA in chunks, and a letter at any particular position, say this is a C or this is a T, will be correlated with what this letter is and what this letter is. So we inherit our DNA in chunks, and that introduces a correlation between nearby parts of our DNA. And that correlation structure is called linkage disequilibrium. So when you do a genome-wide association study, even though there might only be one genetic variant that's really causal, that's actually the thing that increases your risk of MS, you see a peak of association. And that's because, say, this variant is causal, if all of these other variants are associated with it, they will also appear to be associated with the disease. But if you knock these into a mouse model, they wouldn't give the mouse MS. So it's tricky to go from these peaks to which variant is actually driving this peak. And a convenient fact is that because of human history, how humans have spread across the globe, people from different ancestries have slightly different linkage disequilibrium structures. So the correlation between these variants differs between ancestries. So this convenient fact allows us to do something really cool. It means that if you do a GWAS of the same disease, assuming that it's the same underlying causal variant in different populations, you will see a different peak of association. And laying those peaks on top of each other will allow us to pinpoint what the driving changes are, what the causal variant is at the locus. And despite that amazing map of genetic associations of MS, actually the mechanism, the causal variant at those loci, for the vast majority of them, is not yet known. And that's because this sounds trivial, but it's actually really difficult to do. So cross-ethnic fine mapping, leveraging GWAS data from different populations, is an amazing window into doing that. And by understanding causal variants, that's what leads to disease mechanisms and to developing new drug targets. And I think this is analogous to blind people and the elephant. So doing a GWAS in one population you get a particular window into the genetics of each individual locus that's associated with the disease. But by doing this in different ancestries and then combining that information, we're far more likely to find out what those causal driving changes in DNA actually are. So what next? Well, studying genetics across ancestries might tell us about genetic heterogeneity. Perhaps the genetic basis of the disease is different across ancestries. And there are two main ways in which it might do this. So firstly, we might see that the same allele has a radically different effect across ancestries. And secondly, 
Because of those differences in which genetic variants we have between different ancestries, there might be some alleles which are absent in one population but are present in another. And if those are associated with MS, that's really interesting as well. So what, what can this tell us? What can genetic heterogeneity tell us? One really cool thing it might tell us is about gene-environment interactions. So suppose you have two populations, one in which smoking is basically universal because the smoking lobby is really powerful, and one in which smoking is absent, so it's, it's punishable by law, and so no one smokes. If you have a genetic variant that modifies your risk of MS purely by changing the way that your body metabolizes cigarette smoke, if you do a GWAS of MS in the non-smoking population, that variant won't come up. You won't see a signal. And if you do it in the population where everyone smokes, you'll see a really strong signal. Because in that population, for people who've got the risk allele, the effect of cigarette smoking on their MS risk will be magnified. So that variant will appear to be associated with MS. So genetic heterogeneity can tell us about gene-environment interactions by giving us a window into the genetics in different populations. So if we study MS genetics across the globe, we might find some really important gene-environment interactions. And I think perhaps the best real-world example, so that's kind of a hypothetical scenario, the best real-world example of the power of this approach has come from Sardinia. So Sardinia is a genetically isolated island. It's genetically distinct from the Italian mainland. And in Sardinia, there's an extremely high prevalence of multiple sclerosis. So it's a, a really, really important contribution in this study because G Sardinia is an amazing place to do MS genetics to really understand this disease. And what this study did is they basically did a GWAS of MS risk in Sardinia, and they found a novel mechanism. They found a genetic variant within this gene which encodes the BAF protein, a B-cell survival and proliferation factor, and they linked very nicely genetic variation within this gene to alternative splicing of the transcript to a change in the expression of the protein. And they linked that to endophenotypes, to changes in B cells, changes in immunoglobulins. And this was only possible because of the unique genetic architecture of the Sardinian population. And in fact, this genetic variant was too rare to detect in GWAS of much bigger sample sizes in mainland Europe. So this is an amazing example of why studying the genetics of MS in ancestrally distinct populations might give us different windows into the disease. And as people who do basic biology of MS will know, this BAF mechanism is really important. In fact, the compounds that came out of it failed in trials, but the point stands that this mechanism has universal importance for multiple sclerosis, but we got there by studying a genetically distinct population. I say we, I wasn't involved in this. So the next thing that you could get by studying the genetics of MS in different populations is that it might improve our ability to predict who's going to get MS. Prediction using genetics is becoming more and more fashionable, and as it gets cheaper to genotype people, this might be something that arrives in the clinic in the not-too-distant future. This is going to become especially important if preventive therapies become available, so people are going to start wanting to use EBV vaccines, vitamin D supplementation, cigarette smoking prevention, to see if we can prevent a few cases of MS. Now, the problem with those studies is that they will take a long, long time to bear fruit, and that MS is a relatively rare disease. How do you show the benefit of a preventive measure that might take five, ten years to work, where the disease only affects two in a thousand of the baseline population of the UK? That's really tricky to do. So one way around this is to enrich the trial population for people who are at much higher risk, and genetics gives you a way of doing that. So if you can identify people at genetically high risk, that makes this kind of prevention study more tractable. But again, the problem is that if you try to use genetics to predict someone's risk of getting MS, or for that matter, any disease, the accuracy of that prediction depends crucially on whether that person is well represented in the genetic reference data. So if you're using a GWAS of MS to predict whether someone's going to get MS, if that person's ancestry is totally different from the people who are in the GWAS, the genetic risk score will do very badly. So this has been shown across a range of disorders. And here you can see a nice cartoon showing that this line here, the 100%, is how well a genetic risk score does across a range of diseases for people of European ancestry. And actually, you can see that for Latino Hispanic people or for people of East Asian ancestry, the drop-off in performance isn't too bad. But for people of South Asian or African ancestry, the drop-off is massive. So these genetic risk scores do nearly half as well 
because those people are not represented in the GWAS data that have generated the scores. And we've shown this empirically to be true for MS as well. So we've looked in UK Biobank. There are about 2,500 people with MS, about 100 of whom don't have European ancestry. They're from other backgrounds. And a genetic risk score that uses data from that 2019 GWAS is reasonably good at distinguishing who has MS from who doesn't in the people of European ancestry. So these are rock curves. The orange line is the polygenic risk score. And the green line is if you just use age and sex alone. So you can see the genetic risk score is not perfect. This is nowhere near good enough to ever be used in a clinic, or to yet be used in a clinic, but it does a lot better than age and sex. If you contrast that with how it does in the people of non-European ancestry, it's actually worse than useless. It does worse than using age and sex alone. So by generating a genetic map of MS susceptibility in different ancestries, we're going to pave the way for using genetics to predict MS risk in an equitable fashion that is accurate across different ancestries. And at the moment, that is, that is not the case. Sorry, my side is, uh, slide has been a bit splinched here. The next really interesting thing that you could do if you had a genetic understanding of how genes affect MS risk across different ancestries is you might be able to explain patterns in MS epidemiology across the world, and you might be able to predict the hidden burden of MS, so how much MS is probably going undiagnosed on a population level. So on the right here, you can see the map from the Lancet Burden of Disease study published a few years ago, showing that as you go north, MS gets more and more common. And MS is vanishingly rare if you believe these data at face value in sub-Saharan Africa and in South Asia. Now, we, we know that that's probably, well, that's obviously not true. MS does exist in those countries. And we partly know that from people who've emigrated to high-income countries or who have ancestry from those parts of the world but were born in high-income countries where they have good access to neurologists and to MRI. But by understanding the genetic basis of MS risk across ancestries, we might be able to superimpose a map of, of how risk alleles are distributed across the world and predict how much MS we would expect to find in these different countries. And deviation from that prediction might just tell you something prosaic, like it's being underdiagnosed, or it might tell you something really interesting, like there are profound gene-environment interactions which are modifying the effect of those alleles. And you can see, trying to do this with DRB11501, you actually see that DRB11501 maps quite nicely onto the prevalence of MS across the world. But we need to extend this beyond the MHC to get a complete understanding of how much MS is missed across the world. And the last argument I want to make to you is that by understanding MS genetics in different ancestries, we might get more of a window into phenotypic heterogeneity. So we, we've heard already today that MS is not the same in any two people. MS is a highly heterogeneous disease. And you've heard already that until a, few, a couple of months ago, we had no idea of how genetics influenced that variability. We now have one locus, and we have a better understanding that it is the brain rather than the immune system that dictates uh, resilience to MS and dictates severity. But still, our genetic understanding is, rel is relatively nascent, and it's taken large, large sample sizes and amazing collaborative efforts to get to those one or two loci. What you see if you look across different countries, different high-income countries, pretty consistently is that MS does appear to be more severe in people from non-European ancestral backgrounds. So the clearest data is for people of, uh, of black American ethnicity who have African ancestry. So these are nice data from the MS PATH study showing you that pretty much across the board, the imaging features of multiple sclerosis are far, far worse in black Americans versus white Americans. And I think this is the nicest study that's shown this because they corrected really assiduously for all kinds of confounders, including socioeconomic status and access to healthcare services. And these differences persist. So I think it's unlikely they're purely driven by differences in socioeconomic status or confounders. I think this is a real biological difference. And so given that there are such stark differences between different ethnicities in terms of how severe MS is, if we can understand the genetic basis within those different ethnicities, it might tell us about the genetics of heterogeneity more broadly. And if we can understand that, we might be able to move towards better genetically informed drug targets for tackling severity and progression rather than just modulating relapse activity.
So that's enough about kind of why we should do this. What are we actually doing? Are, are, we, are we getting off the couch and actually trying to address this question? So we are trying. And again, drawing inspiration from Queen Elizabeth, I think it's fair to say that our efforts are very much nascent. We've recruited a few hundred people, and I'll talk about our study. But these efforts have to start somewhere, and I think that's a really important point. And it would be easy to be cowed by the large sample sizes that you need to do genetics and to just not bother doing this in the first place. But I think it's important that we do, and these efforts do have to start somewhere. So Queen Elizabeth said, when life seems hard, the courageous do not lie down and accept defeat. Instead, they're all the more determined to struggle for a better future. I mean, that sounds quite bombastic, but what I'm really doing is apologising for our small sample sizes so far, but telling you that that is a necessary first stepping stone on the way to doing genetics on the scale that Sergio's already told you about for European ancestry. So we are running a big study called the Adam Study. It's a nationwide study so far just in the UK. And we're recruiting people with MS from diverse ethnic and ancestral backgrounds. Genetic ancestry is something you can measure. Ethnicity is something you can ask people. The two aren't perfectly correlated, but you have to use something as a window in. So we're asking people who identify as non-white British if they want to take part, recruiting through a large network of clinical sites and lots of collaborators who are working hard with us today, which is really nice to see. We're recruiting both online and in person, so people can self-register from home or they can sign up when they come for their infusion or their LP, probably not their LP, that's a bit, uh, a bit cruel, but they can come in for any, while they're uh, in the hospital for routine clinical care for clinics, infusions, that kind of thing. We're getting some basic demographic uh, questions from people. We're getting some information on risk factors and their MS subtype, treatments they've had. And then this is the meat of the study. We're doing a genetic study. So we're genotyping using saliva, using this chip, which is specifically designed to be robust across different ancestries and to capture lots of genetic variation across ancestries. And ultimately, the idea here is we're going to do genetic analysis of susceptibility within each ancestral group and do some severity analysis as well. And we're going to be drawing our controls from these large cohorts, which already have quite ancestrally diverse um, participants who don't have MS. Um, we're, we're doing all right so far, so we are nowhere near the tens of thousands that you've heard about, but we've got 400 people in the first 10 months, which is great, um, and over 60% of them are non-white British. And as you can see from the principal component projections, this is reference 1,000 genomes data on the left. This is the first 192 of our samples that we got uh, through the door last week. And you can see that we've got uh, a, a really cool cohort of people here who identify generally as black British who have African ancestry. And these people here have got South Asian ancestry. And the key night among you will notice that we do have a, a few people of European ancestry as well. We, we've allowed anyone to sign up. We're not turning people away. But the thing I wanted to emphasize is that we've already recruited a large number of people from South Asian and African backgrounds. So we are on our way, but we have a long way to go. And I think I am finishing now. So we need to recruit a lot more people. And the reason for that is for power. So these are the power curves showing you how many cases you need to replicate those European risk signals for MS. And really, we, we need at least three, 400 within each ancestral group to replicate those European signals. To discover new signals, we would need tens of thousands. So that's a long way away. And we're Doing this, we're going to get there by collaboration with our amazing partners across the UK, uh, including uh, MS Register, who aren't a clinical site, um, but lots of amazing clinical sites across the UK. So take-homes. I hope I've convinced you that the answer is yes. We should be studying MS genetics across diverse backgrounds. And the reason for that is that MS affects everyone, but our understanding of its genetic basis has mainly come from people of European ancestry, and that studying MS genetics across ancestries will tell us all of these things. I'm being, I'm being nodded along, so I won't go through them again. And ultimately, we're going to need large cohorts, and we're going to need international collaboration to get there, and to really be able to answer these questions with statistical confidence. So thank you very much. And just to leave you, this is slightly controversial, whether we should be spending time and money doing this among the MS genetics community. But I think this last quote from Queen Elizabeth is quite apt. And she's probably met a few MS geneticists in her time. She said that like all the best families, we have our share of eccentricities, of impetuous and wayward youngsters, and of family disagreements. So I hope as an impetuous and wayward youngster, I've convinced you that this family disagreement shouldn't really be a disagreement after all. So thanks particularly to Ruth. Um, and that's all. Thank you.